And our first speaker is to my left, uh, Horia Musudik, um, who is from Amnesty International, working on the Afghanistan dossier, a journalist in Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, and an expert in the Afghan media, human rights, and women. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Oh, okay. I was thinking this. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much to uh, Mariam Namazi for inviting me to such a wonderful conference and to be part of uh, this initiative. Uh, of course, I, I don't want to complain too much about the time, but it's too little to explain the pain and suffering of uh, people around the world, particularly from Afghanistan. I'm sure many of you know that in the past uh, 35 or 37 years, Afghanistan have always making headlines, but not for the good reasons. You may always hear about bloodshed, about war, about atrocities that are happening in my country, which has started with the invasion of Russia in Afghanistan in 1978. Just going back, why Russia invaded Afghanistan and what role the West and UEC played in bringing fundamentalism and turning my country to the situation that we are now. Afghanistan was one of the very liberal countries in the 1960s and 70s. In 1919, Afghan women were having the right to vote. And in 1960s, Afghanistan was the country that was one of the initiators of CEDAW convention in the United Nations. In 1960s, we had female ministers, we had women members of the parliament, and women were making a lot, or the biggest number of the women in education and in uh, political uh, era. But well, during the Cold War, there wasn't any better reason for US and West to use Afghanistan as a human shield and to support all these fundamentalist groups in Pakistan to fight against Russia. I still remember in late 1970s and early 1980s, it's the same situation for me as an Afghan who has grown up in war and I was just a little child when the war started in my country. Now what's happening in Afghanistan is just a repeat of scenario. The only difference is that now you hear more in media what Taliban are doing, then you didn't hear much what Mujahideen were doing to Afghanistan, and you only heard about what Russia were doing, because this is how the media is in the West, unfortunately. In 1980s, when all these Mujahideen groups were supported by West and by USA, they were burning schools, they were killing female teachers, they were killing students, they were killing civilian servants of the governments. The same atrocity were going on and on. And the US and West just closed their eyes to the fact that what these groups were doing to Afghanistan simply because they wanted to win the Cold War and to put more pressure on Russia and Russia-backed government in Afghanistan. And Afghans were simply caught between hard and rock. From one hand, we had an oppressive regime supported by Russia, which was de denying the basic rights of Afghan people, and thousands of intellectuals and people were just ended up in prisons and they were disappeared for very, very, very minor reasons for practicing their, uh, their rights or sometimes for no reasons. And from the other hand, you had all these Mujahideen groups, fundamentalist groups that were on raise every day and their number turned to 15 groups. And the only thing they were doing was fighting the secular sect of the society, again, killing teachers, killing students, and burning and destroying the basic fundamental uh, in infrastructures of the country. In 1992, after the collapse of communists in, in Russia and the Eastern Bloc was quite destabilized, Afghanistan communist regime also collapsed and Mujahideen took over. During those years, a civil war started in Afghanistan. But unfortunately, Afghanistan was no more in the interest of US and West. 
Because what they really wanted, they got rid of the Russia, and Afghanistan was no more worth it for them. And during those years, what happened, the fighting between the communists and Mujahideen, which were in the villages or in for uh, a kind of un unpopulated area, it brought into the cities. And Mujahideen groups started fighting and killing people for the language you were speaking, from the ethnic group that you were belong to, or for the area that you were living in. I myself, during 1993, was a student at the Kabul University, and the Kabul University turned into a first line of battleground between different Mujahideen functions group, and many of university girls were raped and killed and disappeared. Every night, at the middle of the night, I would woke up with a scream of a girl who was dragged out of her home by Mujahideen groups. And they were gang raped, they were killed, and their bodies were thrown on the streets. I can't also tell you how many countless nights I was sleeping in a chicken house in at the backyard of our home, simply not to be dragged by one of these Mujahideen groups, and I was in the fear of not being gang raped and killed. I had to sh cut short my university studies because as soon as you would go to university, you could be followed by one of those people and you could have been raped, killed, disappeared, or being taken as a sexual slave. This was the horror that we were living. What you're hearing about ICE, this was the nightmare that Afghans are experiencing since 1992 till now. Yes, and, and again, no one was really looking. I struggled looking at EU and USAID funding for Afghanistan from 1992 till 2001. I couldn't find any. Even there wasn't any single penny for development funding for Afghanistan. And you may not believe. Many people, they left the country, including I myself. We have to... We had to leave uh, Afghanistan because of the civil war. And then in 1996, another group called Taliban they took Kabul. Taliban didn't come in 1992. Taliban emerged in 1994 in Pakistan, in Chaman area of Kuwait. And I was totally shocked on 1995 when I was in Pakistan. I could see how the diplomatic elite of Islamabad and how the UN was talking high about Taliban as messengers of peace. I was totally shocked they were talking about how these Taliban want to bring peace, justice, and disarmament to Afghanistan and pave the ground for uh, transfer of power to the ex-king of the country. And this wasn't a Pakistani, this wasn't an Afghan, this was the US and West diplomats, and this was the United Nations. And on that time, I was working as a journalist. The situation continued, and Taliban received enormous support, not only from Pakistan, not only from uh, some uh, Middle Eastern country. I also heard that they were supported by the US administration simply to disarm the armed uh, groups in Afghanistan and to bring peace to the country and to pave the situation for the peaceful transfer of power to the ex-king of the country. Sorry, I can't finish in one minute. <laughs> uh, but yes, I think, where are we now? After 9-11, sorry, I have to cut it short. After 9-11, when Afghanistan once again came at the center of the attention of the world and Afghanistan turned into a home of terrorists and Al-Qaeda, where are we now? The new generation of the Taliban are more brutal than the previous generation of the Taliban who were ruling Afghanistan in 1990s. Many acts of violence that the new generation of the Taliban are committing now in Afghanistan, they are even being dismissed by the standard of X generation of the Taliban. This is the same with ICE house, as the ICE have been denounced by Al-Qaeda because the brutalities that they are using is beyond the standard of Al-Qaeda. It's the same thing. How we can tackle this situation? I can, I, I, I'm just building on what Karima said. Let's 
hear the voices of those people, those Muslims all around the world who are victims of these fundamentalist groups. Let's empower them. Unfortunately, this doesn't happen. This is, again, Western diplomats who are feeding us now with the idea of like-minded Taliban. And the same mistake is happening again and again, even in Syria, when the West was talking about like-minded Syria opposition groups, I was terrified. Are they going to repeat the same mistakes as they did in Afghanistan? And unfortunately, it proved yes. And they continue repeating the same mistake on and on. We, as citizens of this world, we have a responsibility, first, to stop our governments by using excuses and play with the words and branding some like-minded and some as fundamentalism. Fundamentalism doesn't have any border or any boundary. Second, what we really need is support for secular voices and for the people who their basic rights are being violated every day by the fundamentalist groups and they have no voice. Unfortunately, we are not the ones who are making the peace negotiations. It's always the fundamentalist groups who are part of the peace negotiations with the uh, governments or with the Western powers. And we, as citizens of the world, we should really show to the world how we, as people of Islamic countries, are falling every day victim in the hand of the IS, Al-Qaeda, Taliban, uh, Boko Haram, and many others. What really peace negotiations means for a woman like me? I'm really frightened when I'm talking about these peace negotiations. This doesn't mean that I'm supporting war, because someone like me who grew up in war cannot appreciate more peace than anyone around the world. But at the same time, peace shouldn't come at the price of justice. Peace shouldn't come at the price of my rights. Peace shouldn't come at the price of my children uh, losing the right to their basic right to education, as we did in 1990s by the Taliban. I don't want to take much of your time, and I will appreciate if you have any questions, if we can have it uh, during uh, question and answer. Thank you very much.